Over the past few weeks, I've been asked several questions about the sovereign citizen movement. What is a sovereign citizen or a national citizen? What do those in the sovereign citizen movement believe? What is their belief based on? And does the evidence support their assumptions? What are the consequences of following the recommendations from the movement? I thought it was time to not only dive into the facts of this movement, but to bring my findings to everyone here at the Constitution Study. Everyday Americans, Paul Engel here with the Constitution Study, where we read and study the Constitution to teach rising generation be free. I am so glad you could join me today. You know, sometimes I get one of those questions so often, I just have to bring my findings to you because it's obviously on the mind of a lot of people, which is what we'll be doing here today. You can find out more at the website, constitutionstudy.com, and I'll talk a bit more about that at the end. But for now, let's take a look at the sovereign citizen movement. I am not an expert on the sovereign citizen movement, but I have had plenty of people ask me about it. Now, many of them point me to different resources to prove the validity of their claims. In this episode, I will be reviewing the evidence that I have been provided so far, along with my research into that evidence. Let's start by answering the question, what is the sovereign citizen movement? From what I've found, the sovereign citizen movement is more of a, a loose association of different activists with one common objection that the laws of the United States are illegitimate. Their claim of sovereignty appears to be the rationale behind their claim not to be subject to certain laws, either because they do not fit their interpretation of common law or because they did not consent to them personally. While there is no document that defines the sovereign citizen movement, there are two almost universal beliefs I have found among its inherents. The government and its taxes are illegitimate. The most common claim I hear from sovereign citizens is that the United States was turned into a corporation in 1871 and is therefore illegitimate. The sovereign citizens are not the only ones to make such a claim. I even wrote about a previous article about it called USA Inc. Since then, more people have provided more evidence, so I think it prudent to go through this argument again. I will take the claims of the sovereign citizens that the United States is incorporated, while I'll take their arguments in the order of their popularity. While frequently referred to by sovereign citizens as the Incorporation Act of 1871, the proper name of the law they are referring to is the District of Columbia Act of 1871. The claim is that this legislation incorporated the United States and established the federal government as the government of the Corporation of the United States, not the Republic of the United States. But is that what the District of Columbia Act of 1871 actually did? Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that all that part of the territory of the United States included within the limits of the District of Columbia be, and the same is hereby, created into a government by the name of the District of Columbia, by which name it is constituted a body corporate for municipal purposes, and may contract and be contracted with, sue and be sued, plead and impleaded, have a seal, and exercise all other powers of a municipal corporation, not inconsistent with the Constitution and laws of the United States and the provisions of this Act. All that the District of Columbia Act of 1871 did was create a municipal corporation by the name of the District of Columbia and establish a government for it. Some might point out that I've only quoted Section 1 of the Act. While that is true, read the rest of the Act and all you'll see are the details of the government the Act created. Far from the smoking gun some seem to think it is, the District of Columbia Act of 1871 did not create a corporation named the United States of America. After I published my article on USA Inc., people reached out and said, the proof that the United States is a corporation can be found in the case Stoutenberg v. Henrich. This case, which involved the district collecting license taxes, was supposed to prove their case, but when I read it, guess what I found? It quoted the District of Columbia Act of 1871. Now, since Stoutenberg v. Henrich merely repeated the District of Columbia Act, there's nothing new there. Probably the most compelling argument for the claim that the United States is a corporation comes from Title 28, Section 3002 of the United States Code. United States means a federal corporation. 
There it is in black and white. The United States means a federal corporation. Or does it? See, Section 3002 reads, As used in this chapter, the United States means a federal corporation, an agency, department, commission, board, or other entity of the United States, or an instrumentality of the United States. See, Section 3002 is a list of definitions for a single chapter of Title 28. If we're talking definitions, then let's look up some definitions. And the most important definition in this conversation is the definition of a corporation. According to the Free Legal Dictionary, a corporation is an organization formed with state government approval to act as an artificial person to carry on business or other activities which can sue or be sued and, unless it is nonprofit, can issue shares of stock to raise funds with which to start a business or increase its capital. One benefit is that a corporation's liability for damages or debts is limited to its assets, so the shareholders and officers are protected from personal claims unless they commit fraud. A corporation is nothing more than an organization that acts as an artificial person for legal purposes. That means you can sue them or be sued by them because they are a legal entity. There are many different types of corporations, but they are divided into two general types, private corporations and public corporations. What are the differences between these two types of corporations? If the corporation is not created for the administration of political or municipal power, the corporation is private. If the stock is owned by private persons, it is a private corporation. Seems simple enough. Private corporations are created for purposes other than the administration of political or municipal powers and is owned by private persons. Public corporations, which are also called political and sometimes municipal corporations, are those which have for their object the government of a portion of the state. Nations or states are denominated by publicists, bodies politic, and said to have their affairs and interests and to deliberate and resolve in common. Thus, they become as moral persons, having an understanding and will particular to themselves and are susceptible of obligations and laws. In this extensive sense, the United States may be termed a corporation, and so may each state singly. So yes, in its most expansive definition, the United States is a public corporation. As a public corporation, though, it is not run by a board or owned by shareholders. Rather, the corporation is a legal entity allowing the United States to sue or be sued. But with that definition in mind, let's go back to Title 28, Section 3002. As used in this chapter, United States means a federal corporation, an agency, department, commission, board, or other entity of the United States, or an instrumentality of the United States. See, in the chapter of the United States Code that includes Section 3002, the term United States may mean one of three things, a federal corporation, an agency or department of the United States, or an instrument of the United States. On closer inspection, notice that subsection A does not define the United States as the federal corporation, but a federal corporation. That means the term may mean one of many corporations created by the federal government. There's more. As I frequently say, context is important. Title 28 of the United States Code, Section 3002, should not be taken out of its context. As it states, the purpose of Section 3002 is to define terms when used within a specific chapter of the United States Code. What chapter is Title 28, Section 3002 a part of? Chapter 176, Federal Debt Collection Procedures. What is the purpose of Chapter 176 of Title 28? In general, except as provided in Subsection B, the chapter provides the exclusive civil procedure for the United States to recover a judgment on debt or to obtain before judgment on a claim for a debt, a remedy in connection with such claim. So it appears at first glance to be the strongest argument yet that there is a United States corporation separate from the Republic crumbles and blows away as dust in the wind with just the smallest amount of investigation. Along with it, all the claims about commercial law, admiralty law, and the nonsense that putting gold fringe on a flag somehow changes the Republic. One of the claims of sovereign citizens is that United States citizenship is a member in the corporation, not the country. As such, they claim immunity from most laws of the United States by renouncing their federal citizenship, claiming only citizenship in their state. While it's possible for one to renounce their United States citizenship, the consequences are not what the sovereign citizen movement claim. 
when you renounce your citizenship, you become a resident alien without a country. Now, this can lead to some unintended consequences. For example, you lose your right to vote. Although there are attempts being made mostly at the municipal level to allow non-citizens to vote, if you renounce your citizenship, you are renouncing your right to vote. Then there's the question of international travel. While it is possible for someone to get a United States passport as a resident alien, it would be clearly marked as such, which may lead other nations to question its legitimacy. While not dependent on the sovereign citizen movement, one of the many claims made by those within the movement is that the federal income tax is unconstitutional. Some claim that since sovereign citizens are not citizens of the federal corporation, they are not subject to the tax. Others point to the Supreme Court case Bruchaber versus Union Pacific Railroad Company, which reads in part, the 16th Amendment does not purport to confer power to levy income taxes in a generic sense. As is so frequently the case, those making this claim are taking this quote out of context. The 16th Amendment does not purport to confer power to levy income taxes in a generic sense, as that authority was already possessed, or to limit and distinguish between one kind of income tax and another. But its purpose is to relieve all income taxes when imposed from apportionment from consideration of the source whence the income is derived. In other words, the 16th Amendment did not create an income tax, but allow Congress to collect one directly from the people without apportionment to the states. By far, the most foolish claim is that there is not a legal definition of taxable income. A grand total of five minutes of research led me to Section 63 of Title 26, which reads, Taxable income defined, in general, except as provided in subsection B, for purposes of this subtitle, the term taxable income means gross income minus the deductions allowed by this chapter other than the standard deduction. So the federal income tax is constitutional, and there is a legal definition of taxable income. So where does this leave the sovereign citizen movement? While it still has its adherents, the evidence seems pretty clear that the movement is a hoax. Some may follow it because they truly believe, others because it gives them a sense of power, but the facts show that the movement is based on fantasy, not facts. Now, I understand the desire to find someone or something to blame. With all of the corruption in governments at all levels, we would like to find something we can do to get our rights and liberties back. Let's face it, the sovereign citizen movement, along with so many other conspiracy theories, are just another distraction, a way to point the finger at someone else and ignore the culpability of the American people. We have spent decades voting for people not because they had a reputation of protecting our rights, but because they looked good, told us what we wanted to hear, and most important, because they promised to give us stuff and get other people to pay for it. We the people have sold our birthright of liberty and justice for the false promise of someone else taking care of us, and now we're paying the price. Is it that we need to do something or that we need to do the right thing, something that would actually make a difference? What if all the time, effort, and money wasted on the fantasy of the sovereign citizen movement were spent on educating the people on how to choose better representatives at all levels? What if we listened to the words of our first Chief Justice, John Jay, when he said, Every member of the state ought diligently to read and to study the constitution of his country and teach the rising generation to be free. By knowing their rights, they sooner will perceive when they are violated and be the better prepared to defend and assert them. What if, instead of expecting other people to defend and assert our rights, we learned how to do it for ourselves? What if we asked the same question John F. Kennedy asked? And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Perhaps if we spent less time looking for someone else to clean up the mess we made, we could find the time, energy, and money to start fixing it ourselves. I'm sure by now there are some in my audience that are very mad at me. They are part of the sovereign citizen movement. They believe in the sovereign citizen movement. Or they've been researching it and they listen to, this, to all the, the arguments made and never realize just how flimsy the arguments are. They're mad at me. And I understand. See, it wasn't my intention to aggravate you, it's my intention to enlighten you, to show the, the weak foundation that the movement is placed on. I understand the logic. I, I would love to be, simply say, it was that person's fault, and if we simply fix this one thing, all our problems go away. But that's not reality. 
the sovereign citizen movement is either a hoax or just another conspiracy theory. Either way, they're a distraction from the truth. They're a distraction from things that will actually make things better. And in many cases, people are harmed when they follow it. People who have renounced their citizenship and now find out, oh, I, I, I can't vote anymore. I'm no longer a citizen of this country. Even the, the basic idea that Congress can somehow make a corporation called the United States is a fallacy. That's not a power delegated to the, to the Congress or the, even the United States by the Constitution. So if they did it, well, that act would be just as void as the Department of Education and the EPA, the CDC, and the FDA. Doesn't mean they don't exist, it just means that they're illegal. But that's not even it. The whole house of cards is, that is a sovereign citizen movement will collapse once you give it a little bit of examination. And I hope, I encourage you to do exactly that. Don't take my words for it. Look it up yourself. If you can find other evidence, send it to me. I'll look at that as well. But no one has yet to send me any evidence that shows somebody created articles of incorporation for the United States. Now, why is this so important? Well, one, I've been getting a lot of questions about it, which tells me that a lot of people are learning about this and are curious. So hopefully I was able to answer those questions. But second of all, it's to show you that how important a little bit of education and a little bit of research is to finding the truth about a lot of these claims. Not just the sovereign citizen movement, but many of the conspiracy theories, the, the admiralty law, the commercial law, the admiralty flag, the federal income tax is unconstitutional, or that the 16th Amendment was never ratified, or that there was another amendment that was ratified but not recorded in our Constitution. Every one of these theories that have been brought to me, when I research them, I find they are floating in midair. There's no foundation. But yet thousands and millions of people follow it. As I often say, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I can lead you to the truth. I can show it to you plain as day, but I can't make you believe. All I can do is offer education, and hopefully you listened. And you'll do your own research and agree with me or don't agree with me. I've done my job if I've brought the information to you. Now, I hope that's the type of thing you like hearing about. In fact, if you'd like, if you have other subjects you'd like me to cover, well, by all means, go to the website, constitutionstudy.com. Um, ask me a question. Contact me. Let me know. If you'd like me to speak at your event or you'd like to interview me for a, a podcast, radio, TV, you can do the same thing at the website as well. Most of all, I hope that the way I went about doing this, rather than simply arguing and yelling and screaming, but looking at the evidence and presenting it to you, I hope you found that worthwhile, worthwhile enough to share and to bring others along right here to the Constitution Study. Love the neighbors and have a few good friends.